Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Julie. Happy Palm Sunday. Thank you, Deuce. Let's give Deuce and our tech team a hand. We have had to do a little adapting today, and that's always fun, but it means our tech team went above and beyond, which is, which is awesome to have a team that can do that and to have such a, an incredible event like He's Alive coming here today. Well, um, I wanted to mention one thing. Yesterday, we had an Easter egg hunt, a community egg hunt. We had about 140 of us pulling that thing off. If you were there, anybody, was anyone there? Was it great? Yes, it was a great day. It was. It was a really fun day. It was a beautiful day. And thousands of people came, so it was, it was great. Just so thankful that we're a church that gets to reach into our community like that, and so thankful that we have such an amazing church that will do that. So um, anyway, the last nine weeks, we have been talking about these stories that Jesus told called parables, and he would share different aspects of the kingdom of heaven in these stories he told, and he'd talk about them as they relate to us now, in our life now, the kingdom of heaven now, all the way into eternity. And so today we're going to take a look at three of these little parables he told in Luke 15. And they're often referred to as the lost parables because they're about three or four different things that were lost. And Jesus was a Jewish rabbi, a Jewish religious teacher. And there were other Jewish religious teachers at the time. And a lot of them did not like Jesus at all. And one group in particular was the Pharisees. They did not like Jesus, most of them. And there were numerous reasons they didn't, but a couple of reasons that they, they really didn't like him because he would often point out their hypocrisy and because Jesus crossed all kinds of social lines with who he would be friends with. People that other Jewish people, other or Jewish religious people wouldn't want to be friends with. So right at the beginning of Luke chapter 15, we see Jesus telling these three lost stories in response to some of these Pharisees judging him for who he was spending time with and even sharing a meal with. And we read this in Luke 15 verses 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were gathering around to hear Jesus because they really liked him and appreciated him. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So in response to this comment, Jesus launches into these stories. And the first parable that Jesus tells is about a sheep that gets lost. And the shepherd leaves his other 99 sheep in the field and he goes to find this one lost sheep. Now, I don't have any sheep, but we do have some chickens at my house. And I remember the first night, winter night, that I went out to close the chicken coop to make sure they'd be safe, and one was missing. Now, chickens are really low on the food chain, and we have all these predators in the woods that, around our house. And they, they like the taste of chicken. We, we know this because it's happened. And so I kind of panicked. I thought, oh, no, we've got a chicken missing. And so I go in, I get my flashlight, I come back out, and I'm trampsing through the woods in the snow, and it's getting cold, and it's dark, and I'm getting caught on thorn bushes, and I'm looking everywhere. I'm calling for the chicken. No chicken. So eventually I go inside. I'm like, I, I just don't know what I'm going to do. And I prayed the chicken wouldn't become, you know, a midnight snack or something. So I'm in there panicking. Finally go to bed. Nothing I can do about it. Get up the next morning and I go out to open the chicken coop to let the chickens out. And who's prancing through the yard, happy to see me, hoping I have some treats for her. And I'm like, oh, the chicken came back. She's okay. She didn't die. And I scoop her up and I'm going to take her back to the other chickens where she'll be safe. And then I hear myself on the way saying, you little brat, I was out last night. I was panicked. I'm in the thorn bushes and I'm getting cold. And do you know nothing good happens after dark? And what kind of, you know, I mean, I'm saying all these crazy things to this chicken. But when I finally set her down in this area where she's safe with all these other chickens, first thing I do, I call my husband. And I'm like, guess what? The chicken's okay. She's fine. And I'm texting our whole family in our family chat. The chicken's fine. She's alive, you know. And we're celebrating over this chicken. And Jesus says that this is what this shepherd did. He, he went and he got his sheep and he carried it back. And it doesn't say this, but I think he had a talk with that sheep on the way back. But he gets the sheep back to safety. And then it says he celebrated with his friends because he found the sheep. And then Jesus tells us in verse 7 the whole point of this parable. And he says this, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. And then the second parable Jesus tells is about a lost coin. And he goes straight into it. He says, or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and she loses one. Now, 
Back in this time, Jewish women would often string 10 silver coins together and wear them as a headband. It was kind of their version of a wedding band. So if she lost one of these coins, that would have been a big deal because it was very valuable. And so Jesus goes on and says, doesn't she light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together and she says, rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. And Jesus says again, in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And remember, the whole time the Pharisees are listening to Jesus tell these stories and they know that he's responding to to them putting him down for spending time with these sinners. And the fact that Jesus chooses a shepherd and a woman to be central in these stories, to be kind of heroic, was also kind of a rub because the Pharisees would have looked down upon shepherds and women. But what Jesus is saying is that in the kingdom of heaven, there are no social lines. Everyone is invited. But Jesus isn't done. These are kind of warm-up parables. And so he launches into his final story, and Jesus takes it to a much more personal level. Now, in a lot of our Bibles today, we have these little subtitles before these stories. And sometimes they're helpful. um, Sometimes they're not as helpful. We've added those in. And in front of this story, you might see a subtitle that says, The Prodigal Son. And that's only kind of part true, because actually in this story, there's a father and two sons. And the father represents God, and the father's estate and life kind of represent the kingdom of heaven and then the older son represents the Pharisees and the younger son represents the people they're calling sinners who who Jesus would often spend time with and just a thought about Jesus as a storyteller I think he was the most amazing storyteller of all time I mean, he spoke to all sorts of people and they would flock to listen to him. Even the people who didn't like him would stay and listen to his stories. And think about it, these stories that he told thousands of years ago are told every year thousands of times today. I mean, he had to be amazing, but we often just read these stories kind of monotone and real quick and we don't even think about what might be going on. But I think he was amazing at this. So we're going to slow it down a little bit, but he begins his third story like this. He, and everyone's leaning in and listening. He says, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger one says to, says to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Now this would have been just a shocking way to start a story. Because unlike us, most people in Jesus' crowd, probably everyone in the crowd, unless they were too young, totally understood how a Jewish family's estate worked because it was actually part of the law for it to work in this particular way. And this request by the son would have been shocking. See, with the Jewish law, when the father died, the older son would receive two shares of the inheritance and the rest would split the rest up. So with two sons, the older son would get two thirds and the younger son would get a third. And back in this time, land and property was very closely tied to your wealth and and even to who you were. So these sons probably knew, their father probably had already known, well, this is gonna go to this son and this is gonna go to this son. But what all of Jesus' listeners knew is it was illegal for them to treat it like their own, to sell it, to do anything with it before the father died. And not only that, for this younger son to say, give me my share of the estate was like saying, dad, I wish you were dead because I just want your stuff. Because could you just go ahead and die? And according to Jewish law, this was such a strong, disrespectful statement that this was punishable by a beating for this child or even worse. And so these, these listeners, especially the Pharisees who were very strong rule followers, are thinking, well, we know exactly what this dad has to do. This son is way out of line. And so as, as Jesus makes this first statement, his listeners are thinking, well, what's the dad going to do? Is he going to beat him? Is he going to kick him out of the family? What's he going to do? And as they're wondering, Jesus probably looks around the crowd and then he says what the father did. It says, so he, the father, divided his property between them. And those listening to the story instantly had a picture of how this rumor and this this news would have spread throughout town. I mean, this was going to be the dad that had lost his mind. He was just crazy. It would have lowered his status in the community to give away all of this inheritance. It would have seemed just foolish. The, The disrespect he would have received from this would have been so significant. 
But Jesus continues to build his story, and it actually even gets worse. And he tells this, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. And after he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country and he began to be in need. You know, there are probably some people going, well, yep, I could have told you that would happen. He got what he deserved. That kid shouldn't have done that. Bet he regrets what he did now. But Jesus continues. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into his fields. And again, I just kind of wonder, did Jesus pause? And people are like, okay, well, what did he do? What was his job? Was he sowing grain? You know, was he picking weed? He went into the fields. What was he doing? And then Jesus says, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And I bet people were like, oh, no, Jesus, come on. The story was already going downhill, but pigs? Because see, pigs, they were the most unclean of all the animals to the Jews. You would almost rather die than ever have to be near a pig, much less feed the pigs and take care of the pigs. And then Jesus makes it even worse. He continues, and I kind of wonder, I mean, he was a guy, if there was almost a little for a moment like the gross factor, because he goes, he longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating. I mean, oh. And then he says, but no one gave him anything. And then the crowd might have been like, wow, you know, this is getting kind of serious. But some of the Pharisees might have even been thinking, you know what, okay, maybe Jesus is finally telling a story that makes sense. The rule breaker is getting what he deserves, and that's how it should be. But Jesus isn't done, and he continues. And he says this, when he, this boy, came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out, go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. This was kind of a gutsy move. But also remember, he's in a distant country. He's got a lot of time to think about this and probably rehearse this confession over and over as he travels home. And then we read this, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him and he ran to his son. Now, running for a Jewish man was unheard of, very undignified. He'd have to pull up his robes, his bare legs would show, which you never did. And it just would have been really, again, like there's that crazy dad doing something that you shouldn't do. And as the son saw his dad running towards him, what was he thinking? I mean, it's far off. He doesn't know what his dad's thinking but he knows he ripped his dad off. So is his dad gonna run towards him, just spit in his face? Is he gonna deck him? Is he gonna say, get off my property and never come back? You are no son of mine. I mean, that's, that's what the dad should say. And I just wonder if the son just braced himself. And then we read this. Jesus says the dad gets to the son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. And then the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But it's like the dad doesn't even hear him because the dad just totally ignores that and interrupts him. And the father says to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And see, the best robe was probably the father's robe. And that ring would have brought him back into sonship in the home. It would have signified that he is a son. And the sandals showed that he was a free man. He was not a servant or a slave. Slave. And the father is recognizing and making sure that anyone who sees this boy recognizes this is my son. He is part of my family. And the dad doesn't stop, or Jesus doesn't stop. He continues the story. And the dad says, Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. Now back at this time, to kill the fattened calf was a huge deal. Like you only did that for a major event, a wedding or something like that. And when you did it, it was such a huge amount of meat, you'd invite the whole village. And so they probably invited the entire town. And isn't it ironic that the father throws this giant party, which may have been some of what that son was looking for, a party, when he left. And think about this contrast, the depth of that son's rebellion against the father 
and the extravagance of the celebration for the son when he came home. But why, why in the world would this father do this? Well, then the father tells us, he tells everyone, he might have even been shouting by this point, he goes, for this son of mine was dead. He's alive again, he was lost and he's found. And so they began to celebrate. And this is the place where the first two parables with the sheep and, and the coin, where they end with celebration. But there's more. See, Jesus wants to share more in the story by sharing that while that celebration is going on, something else is taking place. And so he, he continues and he tells his listeners in verse 25, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father's killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And then we read the older brother's response, beginning in verse 28. It says, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. And we don't know how much time passed before the father realized that his older son wasn't in there. But then we read, so his father went out and pleaded with him. And again, we don't know all the words he used to plead with his son. But at some point, this older son just snaps. And Jesus continues. And the older son answered his father, look. All these years, I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes home, or this son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? Now in this culture, again, failing to greet your father with sir or father was just unheard of. And saying look instead would have warranted some sort of a beating. It was incredibly disrespectful. But the father doesn't say, you will not talk to me like that. He doesn't smack him in the face. Instead, the father turns to him and says, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he's found. And that's where Jesus ends the story. And there's so many truths in these parables that, that God has actually challenged me with as I've been working on this. The issues of fairness, even some parenting things, free will, so many things he can show us in this. But for the sake of time, we're going to highlight just three things that God reveals to us through this story about the kingdom of heaven. And these three, three things, these three truths are about rules, a relationship, and relentless love. And the first truth is that following rules does not equal access to the kingdom of heaven. Now let me be clear right up front. Jesus does offer us guidelines to live by that he, he says are good for us. So please don't hear me say rules don't matter. But in this particular parable, Jesus makes it very clear that following rules alone does not give you access to the kingdom of heaven. See, with the Pharisees, how you followed the rules determined if you could know God, if you had access to that kingdom. But Jesus shows it can't be earned by rules. The kingdom of heaven is something that's accepted because it's an offer. And we see this first with the younger son. Did you notice when he comes home, not only did the father not say, tell me where you've been, what you've done, and by the way, you owe me, and let me list your punishment, and you better say you're sorry. He didn't do any of that. He didn't even reprimand him for feeding the pigs. See, this kid has broken all the rules at the dad's expense, at the dad's reputation. But before the son can get a single word of repentance out of his mouth, the father has embraced him. And this dad immediately claims him back. And Jesus is saying, even if you have broken all the rules you've had the chance to break, you are still welcome in the kingdom of heaven. There is still a way. And then there's the older brother. He had kept all the rules. In fact, the older brother, when he goes to his dad, he makes sure his rule following is known, very much like the Pharisees would do. And then when he talks about his little brother, he never says, my brother. He says, your son, because he doesn't want to be associated with the guy who's become a sinner, just like the Pharisees didn't. You, know, you can almost see him pointing his finger in his dad's face and saying, look, 
This is not fair. It's all your fault. This is your son who's breaking all the rules. You're letting him. I have followed all the rules. I should get the party. I should have the celebration. But he's standing outside and he can't even get in to the celebration. See, the Pharisees and so many people really in our world today kind of want to lump people into two groups in this world. They want to say there are the moral people and the immoral people. And the moral people, they play nicely and they behave every, all the time. They follow the rules. They're going to get the kingdom of heaven. And the immoral people, they don't. So they're not going to get the kingdom of heaven. But the thing is, it's so easy to believe that, especially if we've lived by the rules most of our lives or even for a while. We can easily be tricked into thinking that if we are just moral, good moral people and do things that are nice, then we're good with God. That our morality, our ability to be kind or to to do something kind means that we're part of the kingdom of God, that we're on the road to eternity with God. When the reality is, we very well may be on the road to eternal separation, which is hell. See, Jesus says this in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform any miracles? And then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. And the term Jesus uses here when he says knew you is a term that refers to knowing somebody very intimately, very personally. And what he's saying is that there are people who may follow the rules really well, be really moral people. They may talk like me, they may act like me, they may claim they know me. Heck, they might even quote me, you know, he's a pretty quotable guy, he's God, right? They may say my words. But what he's saying is if we don't have a personal relationship with him, If we don't know him and we just tag his name onto the nice things we do, that does not equal access to the kingdom of heaven. Ephesians 2 tells us this, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. See, both the older and the younger son thought that getting all they could from their dad, kind of getting the the kingdom of heaven, was all about the rules. The younger one said, I'm going to get away from the rules to enjoy my inheritance. The older one said, I'm going to stay home and follow the rules so I can enjoy my inheritance. And both ended up separated from the source of their inheritance. And so let me ask you, who do you identify with most? The younger brother you know, the rule breaker, the older brother, he follows all the rules, or maybe both. I think it was Henry Nouwen who said this, it's hard to stop being the younger brother without becoming the older brother. And I think that's such a wise statement. I know this is true. See, I've lived like both brothers. I have lived like that younger brother and sought freedom far away in rebellion to all the rules. And I've also lived like that older brother, trying to follow all the rules, thinking, well, then that's what's going to make God love me more. But I bet there's some of us also sitting here thinking, well, you know what? If rules aren't the key to the kingdom of heaven, if God's going to forgive me anyway, then why don't I just live in whatever way I want? Because I'll just do whatever feels best to me and it'll be good. But here's the problem with this. It's true that following rules does not equal access to the kingdom of heaven. But it's also true that God is the ruler of heaven. See, in this life, we all choose someone's rules to live by. And if we don't choose God's, we'll choose another religion, another person. Maybe we'll choose ourselves. We make our own set of rules, whatever we think is best. But the truth about being in the kingdom of heaven is that when we read about Jesus' life and when he invites other people in, he says repeatedly, obey me, follow me, do what I do. Multiple times we see Jesus come alongside someone and care for them significantly and then he turns to them and he says, go and sin no more, live differently. And see, in this story, Jesus shows that God has a much bigger picture of life than we do. God's guidelines are the key to living a life of true freedom. See, when the father gave his younger son that inheritance, that younger son had everything. He enabled unbelievable freedom for this young man. And the things that he gave him were valuable and good. However, when the son pursues freedom by his own terms, by his own set of rules, he ended up enslaved. 
And then when he comes back to his dad's house, willing to be enslaved, he finds incredible freedom living under his father's household and his father's guidelines. See, when Jesus talks about following his rules, here's what he says in John 14, verse 15. If you love me, keep or obey my commands. And I think there's a key in one little word here. He doesn't say, if you want to get into the kingdom of heaven, obey me. He says, if you love me, obey me. It begins with the relationship, and then the result is obedience. You know, I've been married for a while now, and sometimes the commitment that my husband and I made, the rules that we decided that we would live by are rules that I don't feel like following. Like, it's just not easy. Like, they're not what I want to do. You know, be patient and, and, and put the other person first and, you know, all the be, be sacrificial to them and better or worse. You know, when he brought home 27 chickens recently and I didn't know, I didn't want to be patient, you know? I didn't want to put his desires first. No, I, I like the chickens. But, but really, like, it doesn't mean that God's rules are always going to be easy. In this world, the world's going to tell you to do a lot of different things. Your own self is going to tell you to do a lot of different things. But God's rules are there because he does want to bring freedom. And similar to my relationship with my husband, the more we live within the guidelines and, and the commitments we made, the more freedom we have in our relationship and the better it gets. And that's the same with God. Once you get to know God in a personal relationship and you really learn the truth of some of the things he says, like when he says, I am the God of all comfort and when you need comfort, I will comfort you and I will counsel you. Or when he says things like, I have faced every temptation that you have faced and now I stand before God as your advocate. Or when he says, I have come to give you life to the full or I will work all things together for good for those who love me you suddenly realize, wow, he's for me. I mean, God is God. He is not trying to get something from us when he gives us guidelines. He's trying to give something to us and provide for us. There's nothing he can take from us that will make him more God. He's got it all. But he says there is a way to live that is so freeing and does not lead to enslavement. So if following the rules doesn't gain us access, access to the kingdom of heaven, but obedience is our response to our knowing him, then this leads to our second truth. And the second truth is that the kingdom of heaven is primarily about a personal relationship. In fact, there's no way into the kingdom of heaven unless you have that personal relationship. And we read Jesus' words again in John 14. He says, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. It's all about knowing God and knowing his Son. And what we see in the story is that with both sons, their actions were not because they loved their Father. They thought they could get from their Father what they thought they would love. But they lacked the relationship. And when the, when the Father sees this younger son arrive back home, and he says, for the son of mine was dead and, al and is alive again. He was lost and is found. I mean, think about that for a minute. Why would he say that? Because the son is not dead. He's standing there in front of his father and he's not lost. The son knew where he was. He knew how to get home. But the word, the term that, this, this that Jesus uses in the story when the father says my son is lost is not like I lost my keys. This term is a really strong term and it means to perish with death being certain. And what he's saying is that when the son was separated from the father, he was as good as dead. But when he was reunited with the father in relationship, he was alive again. And what Jesus' point is, is that all of us are only truly alive when we're in a relationship with our God and our creator. We may think we're alive like the son did, but the reality of, of this is that the stuff of this world will run out. And our days of morality or immorality will run out. And if we have not begun that relationship with God our Father, then we will be forever eternally separated from him. If we do not begin that relationship with him, we may think we're alive, but really we're like walking dead men and women. 
And with the older son, when the dad said, everything I have in your, is yours, this was literally true. Remember at the beginning, when the younger son asked for his inheritance, his father didn't just give the younger son his inheritance. It says the father divided his property between them. So at that point, both sons had all they could have on this earth, in this life. And incidentally, this is an incredible picture of God's free will, where he says, I will open-handedly offer you a place in the kingdom of heaven, in my kingdom. Everything is here for you, and we get to choose what we'll do with it. But remember the older son comes in from working in the field, and he gets near the house, and he can hear the music, and he can hear the dancing, but he doesn't go inside. Instead of walking into his house like any son would, especially house that was going to be his, part of his inheritance, he behaves like he's a servant, and he asks another servant, what's going on in there? And then the older son deliberately chooses to reject the celebration because he does not want to engage in the relationship with his little brother and his father. See, if we reject the relationship that's offered to us by God the Father, we are rejecting the kingdom of heaven and this eternal life he offers us because the kingdom of heaven is not something that begins when we die. The entry point to the kingdom of heaven is here in this life now. This is when we get to choose. In the book of, of John, we hear a prayer that Jesus prayed to God the night before he went to the cross. And this is the one time that he really defines eternal life. And here's what he says in John 17, 3. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. This is eternal life. This is the key to the kingdom of heaven, to know God and to know Jesus in that intimate relationship. And so this brings us to our third point, how we do this. The third truth is that the kingdom of heaven is built on relentless love. Now did you notice that in all three parables, the lost things are pursued. And in the final parable, the father goes out to both sons. And it wasn't a mistake that Jesus had the father run towards that younger son. This is like the over-the-top, unbelievable way for us to know that the moment we turn to God, there is no hesitation. He is immediately ready to welcome us in. And then we see something that's almost more astounding with the, with the older son. And it's this, that even when we are blind to our need for him, he relentlessly pursues us. He comes out to find us, and he's not mad at us. Remember we read in Luke 15, 28, the older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. And again, I think Jesus chose his words so carefully because this word pleaded means to come alongside someone, to comfort them, to help them, and to be their advocate. And earlier in the same book of Luke, Luke is writing and he uses the same word to describe Jesus as our advocate. And then a little later, Jesus uses the same word to name his Holy Spirit. And this is a big deal because the Holy Spirit is the person of God who comes alongside us and when, we, when we turn to God and when we repent and he marks us as God's child so that we are an identifiable heir of the kingdom of heaven. And Romans 8 explains this in verse 15. It starts, The spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. But there's a catch. The younger brother could only be brought back into this family at, the cost, at a cost to someone. That celebration cost something. The younger brother had nothing left. It was going to cost him to live. And the older brother could have looked at this as cutting into his inheritance. And culturally at this time, one job, one responsibility of an older brother was to reconcile any difference between a younger brother and his father. In fact, a good older brother in this situation, while the younger son was off, living his crazy life, the older brother would have gone to the father and said, Dad, I'm going to go get my younger brother, and even if it costs me, I'm going to bring him back. And see, what God knows is that we all need a good older brother. 
Not one who will just go to another city and bring us back, but we need a good older brother who will leave heaven and come down and basically rescue us and offer us joint heirship in the kingdom of heaven. And see, when Jesus talks about God in the Bible, every time he talks about him except once, he refers to God as his father. And the one time he doesn't call him father is when he's on the cross, when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because for that one time, Jesus was separated from his father. He was forsaken. He was lost with death being certain because he was separated. And whether we are more like the younger brother or the older brother, our death will result in eternal separation from God if we do not know him in that relationship. But God's relentless love pursues us. And so he sent us that good older brother in Jesus. And Jesus willingly walked towards that cross, ready to have our sin laid on him, and then buried with him, and then raised again so he could offer us this co-heirship leading to eternal life at this side of heaven. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says this, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, the walking dead. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. See, he is the God who gave all so that we can have all if we so choose. I don't know who said this, but it, it stuck with me for a while. The reason it seems so easy for us to be saved is because it cost God so much. He intentionally lost his life so that we could then find our life. So why doesn't Jesus tell us how it ends with these two sons? You know, did the older son go into the party? Did the younger son come out? Did they duke it out? Did they make up? Did they go into business together? You know, YouTube channel it. I mean, what'd they do? What happened? Jesus doesn't tell us. And I think this is on purpose. I think he wants us to wrestle with. And the people who were listening to him, the sinners around him who he, he had befriended and the Pharisees, he's saying, look, everyone gets access. But Pharisees, it's not because you follow the rules. And everyone's invited. There are no social lines. But it's a choice. I offer it. And it's a choice. Will you enter into a relationship with me and get to know me and my father? And he presents the same choice to each one of us today. Well, in just a minute, we're going to sing another song. And then we're going to share communion. And here's, here's what I want to suggest. If you already know God and you're in that relationship and he is your father, I hope this is a time where you can kind of get right with him. Remember, he knows we make mistakes and he's not mad. And then I hope you can celebrate during that time of communion. And if you do not yet know God as your father, I wanna invite you to just take this bit of time, the song and the time that we're taking communion, and just consider that gift, consider that offer he's made you to, be, to become part of his kingdom and to enter into a relationship with him. And then we're gonna have a time where if that's what you'd like to do, we're just gonna have a short little conversation with God and you'll have that opportunity to do that.